This lecture is patent novelty. Today's agenda, we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about novelty, the basics of this idea of why uh, and how patents must be novel, or patent applications must be novel in order to become patents. Uh, we're going to talk about statutory bars, which are a feature of uh, what I'll describe as the old law, the law that was in effect until uh, March 2013. Uh, the new law doesn't have statutory bars per se, but as we'll talk about in the third part today, the first to file AIA component of this lecture, um, the, the changes to um, the patent law that took effect in March 2013 um, largely cover the same ground uh, that the old law's statutory bars concept did. Right? But in any event, let's move first to novelty. So I do want to point out again that there there is a change in this area of law. Um, section 102, which is the area that we are uh, looking into, that part of the statute that we're looking into for this lecture, uh, was amended um, by the America Invents Act, um, which uh, was signed into law by President Obama uh, September 16, 2011. Um, the, the, one of the key changes, I have a list here of changes, but the key change for, for our purposes here is that we change to what is described now as first inventor to file. That change, though, only applies to patents that are applied for on or after March 16, 2013. Any patent filed before that date uses the old law. Uh, patents filed on or after that date uses the new law because of this law shift and because of the long time lag. Um, that means for most of your career as an intellectual property, you're going to be dealing with both of these laws. Um, uh, there are probably very few patents, if any, yet uh, that have been issued uh, using the new law. Um, and for uh, several years on, there will be patents being issued using the old law. And of course, whichever law they were, uh, whichever time they were applied, is going to determine the law used when they get litigated. Um, the average uh, age of a patent. Uh, when it's litigated uh, is somewhere around 8 to 10 years, uh, which means it's going to be quite a long time before the new law's effect um, actually is seen in litigation. So for that reason, we're going to learn uh, the old law, and then we're going to look at the end of this lecture on the new law. So on the left side here is the old law, section 102, 102A, which is the basic novelty requirement. Right? A person shall be entitled to a patent unless A, the invention was known or used by others in this country or patented or described in a printed publication in this or a foreign country before the invention thereof by the applicant for the patent. Right. So a couple of things. First, note the structure of this. A person shall be entitled to a patent unless. Right. There's a presumption in favor of patenting, which means that the patent office, as a practical matter, has to prove to you um, that you are not entitled to the patent uh, during that time frame. Uh, or for your invention, right? Or that there's a that there's a timing problem. So that the the presumption it means that the that the applicant has, in a sense, a thumb on the scale in favor of, of patentability. Um, and the other thing to, under, to note in the old law is that the invention was known or used by others in this country, right? There's a limitation on the uh, range of knowledge that can be applied against a patent application um, uh, that it be only used in this country, whereas printed publications Right, uh, are either this or a foreign country. And you might ask yourself why that distinction. And I think it comes from the idea that it's much more likely that people would know about a printed publication in a foreign country than they would about a use in a foreign country. Right. So think about somebody plowing the fields, for example, in Germany. Is it realistic that the farmers in America would know of that technology? Right? 
whereas it might be quite realistic that a scientific researcher uh, in America would have understood the publication of a scientist working in the same field in Germany, right? So that's the basic distinction there, is the idea is that we are not going to hold it against American inventors, the use of inventions in other countries, um, but we will um, use as prior art the publications of other countries, right? And as an aside, and we'll talk about this later, um, the new law after the new AIA, the new 102, uh, removes that distinction. But the real key here is what the critical date is, right? What is the date um, to think about in terms of novelty? And for the old law until March 16th, it's before the invention thereof, right? Which that, that means the date of the invention is the key date, right? Anything before the date you invent something is fair game uh, for purposes of the novelty inquiry. And indeed for many of the other inquiries uh, involved in the, the standards for patentability. The new law, that changes to the filing date, right? And we're going to talk later about what exactly this change has to do with it. The reason that we did this change is that the rest of the world uh, has moved to a um, first-to-file system. Uh, the argument in favor of first-to-file is basically that it's much more administrative, uh, administratively simple. Right? You don't have to determine dates of invention, as you might imagine. Invention dates can be difficult to determine because often there isn't uh, proof about exactly what time frame people thought the invention uh, was made. What do we mean by invention? Does it mean you have the entire invention completed with a prototype? Does it mean it's all completed in your mind, but maybe not put down on paper? What exactly do we mean? Right. So those issues make the a first to invent system, which is what our old system was, relatively more complicated. Now the reason that we liked the old system, that many people like the old system, is because it rewards the inventor, right? It award, rewards the person who is truly the first to invent um, and uses that as, as novelty as the basis for novelty, whereas the first to file system may not reward the person who's first to invent. Instead, it rewards the person who's first to get to the patent office and file a patent application. That may often be the first person to invent, but that's not necessarily the case. And you might imagine that you know, large, well-funded companies are going to be better at getting to the patent office faster. Small or individual inventors are going to be less good about getting there fast, and therefore there might be a distributional consequence to moving from uh, first to invent to first to file. And indeed, uh, some research that, that, that I and Professor Abrams have done uh, bears this out. And we'll talk about that a little later. But I just wanted to highlight the differences here. Right? So the key date for novelty is the date of invention under the old law. New law, the key date for novelty is the effective filing date. There's some exceptions to the new law, um, which we will talk about in a moment. So let's talk about novelty. Right, so the Rosair case is a, is a decent lens through which to understand what we mean when we say by novelty. Right, so here we have uh, this idea of a method for prospecting for oil. Um, Teplitz uh, was um, uh, somebody who uh, everyone agrees the Teplitz uh, conceived of this invention uh, prior to Rosair, but did not file for it. Um, until well after, right? And 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 Rosaire filed first. Rosaire didn't know of Teplitz's uh, invention, but that doesn't matter. Uh, what mattered was for Rosaire's uh, novelty was that Teplitz had indeed invented it. Now, um, the question in the case was. Uh, even though Teplitz invented it, it's not like it was in widespread distribution, right? Teplitz had invented this new process, did some testing. Um, the testing was sort of in the open, but not exactly public. It's not like they were um, building billboards or anything to tell people that they were uh, trying to discover a new method for, for prospecting for hydrocarbons or anything like that. They didn't necessarily try and hide it. It was just sort of the ordinary course of their business. And the, um, uh, the question in the case is, is that enough to destroy novelty? Right? It, didn't, it wasn't clear that Teplitz had abandoned or completely uh, 
given up on the invention, and in fact, Teplitz later files for um, uh, a patent. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the, the question here is whether or not those are uh, invalidating prior art um, as against Teplitz, right? And what we mean by novelty is to consider the claims of Rosaire's patent, right? And what, so meaning what exactly Rosaire is, is stating to be his invention. And we compare those claims to what Teplitz um, uh, used uh, prior to Rosaire's invention date, right? That's what we mean. And if they match up, meaning that what Rose, that what Teplitz was doing, was indeed the same thing as what's in Rosaire's claims, then um, 102 is violated, right? There it is not the invention. Rosaire's invention is not novel and not um, uh, and not eligible for patenting, right? Um, and so that's that's the basics of novelty and the way that you do a novelty analysis is determine what the meaning of the claims are what the scope of the claims are and then you look at the prior art what we mean by prior art under the old law is any art any materials related that are prior to um, the date of um, invention of the the invention alleged to be patentable you look prior to that invention date and you determine whether or not there's a single reference that covers all of what that claim is is covering and if you find that then novelty has been destroyed and there is no patent available so why would we do this why do we have this concept of novelty right I mean why would we not want to reward Rosaire Rosaire made it to the patent office first right and the idea here is that we don't want to allow the Rosaires of the world to effectively withdraw information that's already available to the public so this is why the statute says um, you know use in the public right this is sort of the key element the invention was known or used by others in this country right and the question in Rosaire is what does that mean and the policy argument here is that we want to make sure that we are not giving out patents uh, for things that are already out there right patents are uh, reserved for those things which are new uh, and by new we mean novel as defined by section 102 Right, so they are. Uh, so we are not going to give patents to somebody, a patent to somebody, unless it's truly new and different than everything that's come before. And we use the Section 102 analysis to determine that. Right. Rosaire argues that that although Teplitz did some stuff uh, and invented first, um, he did not make it available to the public. Right. And, and an important concept here is that the courts have long considered prior public use to not necessarily mean public in the ordinary sense of that word, but even one use, even one member of the quote public can be a public use, meaning somebody other than the inventor in a manner in which it was not secret, not intended to um, hide from the public. It doesn't matter how many people use it, doesn't matter how many people know about it, um, as long as it's out there in some sense uh, beyond the scope of just the inventor, then it's going to be a prior public use and potentially invalidating. Now, one thing to note with this is that the courts are going to require in all of these cases involving dates of invention in particular, um, they are uh, the courts require corroboration for this. You can't come to court and simply say, I invented that first, right? Or, or I invented in January 2000, uh, you know, conveniently, uh, you know, six months before you invented, right? You have to have corroborating evidence. 
Often that means things like documentation uh, that was contemporaneous. Uh, lab notebooks are often used, for example. Um, people will take pictures or, or make other sorts of records to uh, memorialize dates of invention. These are all important in later proving um, a prior date of invention uh, because the courts will simply not accept testimony uh, for this evidence uh, for reasons you can understand, right? Um, both because people would have a strong incentive to lie and because we know, because of social science research, that people are inherently biased, right? They always think um, that they invented things before they actually did or they invented more than they actually did. And because of that, the courts are, are very... Um, uh, they're very insistent on corroborating evidence in order to make this uh, this occur, or in order to make these these um, things occur. The other, the next thing to talk about with respect to um, novelty is the concept of inherency, right? So I described the novelty inquiry to you a couple minutes ago, and I described it as follows: you you look at the prior art that is the art prior to uh, the date of invention and you determine whether there's a match between the prior art and what the claims uh, say. Right? Um, that's the basic inquiry for novelty. Right? However, it's not true that the prior art has to disclose everything that's in the claim. Right? It has to, uh, if there are uh, subject matter involved that the if the prior art necessarily functions in accordance with or includes the claims limitations it anticipates right um, anticipation is what we call um, destroying novelty right that's the 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 patent law term for lacking novelty if your claim lacks novelty it is quote anticipated right it's anticipated by the piece of prior art a piece of prior art can anticipate your claim even though every detail of your claim is not included in the piece of prior art as long as it's inherently there, right? And what we mean by inherently is if it necessarily functions in accordance with or includes these claim limitations it anticipates, right? So understanding this can be a little bit complicated, but I think it's best to think about it this way, right? So assume on the left here we have an explicit description, right? I have a, you know, a, a paper, right? A scientific journal paper that describes a new uh, plow for snow, right? And the question is, do you, you know, there are certain details not included in that in that paper that are nonetheless in the claim that we're trying to evaluate for novelty, right? And it, the people of ordinary skill in the art, right, uh, again, the Fosita would read the technical paper and they would understand more than just what's written in the paper is the basic idea here, right? They would have a broader, a slightly broader understanding of the content of that paper because of their knowledge of the art, right? And the doctrine of inherency says that that counts too for purposes of the novelty requirement that that is combined with the explicit description to create the total scope of disclosure involved in the prior art, right? So anticip the anticipation um, analysis, again, starts with the claim, right? You evaluate what the claim actually means, what, it total what the scope of its coverage is. Then you look prior to the critical date. Again, under the old law, you'd look prior to the invention date. You would look for one prior art reference, that included all of the limitations of the claim that you were trying to evaluate. If it didn't include all of the limitations of the claim, it might inherently include some of those limitations. And again, the question, the standard for inherency is if they are necessarily there, right? If they are necessarily there. If they're not explicitly there, but necessarily there, by which we mean a person of ordinary skill in the art would understand that they are necessarily there, then that anticipates, right? That is the total scope of disclosure, and if it's inherently or explicitly there um, uh, in the prior art, it's anticipated and there's no novelty. Let's move on now to statutory bars. 
Uh, under the old 102, the statutory bar section is 102B, right? Which, again, a person shall be entitled to a patent unless the invention was patented or described in a printed publication in this or a foreign country or in public use or on sale in this country more than one year prior to the date of the application for the patent in the United States, right? So the key here is that 102B has a different critical date. Right, 102A, which is the basic novelty requirement, says the date of invention is your critical date. In 102B, it's one year prior to the date of the application. Right, uh, and so that's important because the other thing that 102B does not include is a restriction on known or used by others. Right, known or used by others. 102B says it's it's patented or in public use or on sale, patented or in a printed publication, public use or on sale, does not include the restriction by others. Right? What that means is that an inventor can invalidate him or herself under 102B, not under 102A. Right? So the inventor can trigger the statutory bar by, for example, publishing information that contain that anticipates his invention um, more than one year prior to the date of his application or he can use his invention in public in a public manner uh, more than one year prior to the date of the application or sell his invention uh, more than one year prior to the date of the application all of those will trigger a statutory bar Right? So it's important to understand that patents must, most, must both be novel and they must comply with statutory bars. Right? And you might ask yourself why. What is the idea behind having both a novelty requirement and a statutory bar requirement, which is close to novelty, but it's, it is subtly different. Right? And the idea here is that there's a certain class of behaviors we want to discourage with the statutory bars and that's the case where the inventor attempts to essentially get the best of both worlds uh, with his or her patented invention by selling, using, or otherwise uh, making benefit of his invention for some period of time and then only later um, applying for the patent, right? Uh, which would have obviously the, the effect of having a longer patent term, right? Because you'd get the advantages of using it. And again, you wouldn't destroy novelty in that case because you were the first to invent, right? So the statutory bar concept makes sure that patent, that inventors get to the patent office quickly, right? We are telling people if you want to um, publish, use, or sell your invention, um, you need to get to the patent office within one year of doing so, right? So note there is a one-year grace period, uh, which means you can do some things uh, and, then, and then wait a year and come to the patent office, but no more than a year. Now, the statutory bar also applies to third parties too, right? So if somebody else, even if they haven't invented something, if they, for example, imported something and used it in the United States more than one year prior to your your application that also triggers a statutory bar right and sometimes people sell things in the US um, and thereby trigger the statutory bar so it's not limited merely to the inventor or inventors themselves although most often uh, triggers against inventors and the idea behind it is to try and prevent uh, inventors from getting sort of a, a double dip here. It's also basically another fail-safe, you know, a, a similar mechanism uh, to this idea that we don't want to give patents out for things that are already out there and available to the public, right? And we think that things that are published on sale in public use more than one year prior to the application, they are effectively out there and we shouldn't be giving patents for them. So let's work through a couple of cases here. So the first one is what is a printed publication for purposes, this actually works for both for purposes of 102A and 102B, and the Hall case um, is the key case here. And one question is, is that, you know, the, the argument is whether this particular dissertation 
um, which was uh, filed and indexed um, in uh, Germany, uh, is why is this not a 102A rejection? Um, and uh, the answer is it might be, uh, but uh, if, if it's a 102B rejection, in some ways that's simpler because you don't have to worry about dates of invention. Right. If it was a uh, if if this reference was was unearthed and and used to challenge the patent, the inventor uh, here Hall could argue uh, and do what's called swear behind this particular reference by saying, "Well, I invented before this date." Right. So if the uh, whatever the date of publication was, um, if however the date of publication is prior to the one year critical date, one year prior to the date of application, then there's no ability for Hall to swear behind that. He, he's stuck under 102B. So even though this might be both a 102A and 102B piece of prior art, it goes under 102B because it's simpler, uh, there's less proofs to worry about, uh, more straightforward. Right? Just note that there's that distinction between those two sections. Right? And the big question in Hall is, what do we mean by a publication? Right? Uh, and the court says, as long as it's indexed and findable, even if there's no evidence that anybody's actually read it, then it's a printed publication. Right? So note that is, again, much like the definition of public use. That's a very broad view of what we mean by publication. The touchstone, the court says, of publication is public accessibility. It doesn't mean widespread public dissemination. Again, just like public use, it doesn't mean people are using it in the public sphere broadly. It simply means that it's available to the public if they want it. And there doesn't have to be any evidence that it's actually been read or been checked out of the library or anything like that, just that it's findable, accessible to the public. Right? So what about posting on the internet? Well, posting on the internet would certainly be um, a, a publication, right? Even though as a formal matter, are you really publishing or not? Um, there were some questions about this when the internet was first coming out. But again, you don't need to show evidence that people have accessed the web page. Uh, it's just that they could, that it was publicly available. Now, the courts do require that it be findable. Right? So if it's just buried somewhere, if, and, and the courts, for example, have held that a printed publication uh, does not apply when the, uh, a doctoral thesis, for example, is not indexed by subject matter. Right? So if, you can't, if somebody was hunting for the particular subject matter and couldn't find it, then that is not a printed publication because it's not publicly accessible. Right? Um, Note that publications can be almost anything, right? Uh, the courts have found uh, that uh, pieces in a museum um, can be a publication because, again, like a model in a museum can certainly disclose aspects of an invention, and just as a publication would, they can reveal to persons of skill in the art details of the invention, and so they are technically, under the patent law, a publication just as much as a printed paper would be. Right, so that's the Hall case, and it, uh, you know, again stands for the proposition that uh, the uh, printed publication uh, concept is again extremely broad, covers almost anything as long as it's publicly accessible. There's a case I had when I was a, a law clerk that actually settled before we could decide it, but it was raised an interesting question, which is. Um, there was a, uh, the technology was new types of cigarette filters, um, and it was, uh, the issue was that the alleged piece of prior art was in a private museum, and by private I mean it was a museum in somebody's uh, penthouse apartment in New York City. Um, this was uh, uh, somebody who had been an executive for a long time, uh, at, in the tobacco industry and had amassed over the years sort of a, a very, very interesting collection of historic um, uh, uh, cigarette technologies, I guess you'd say. Uh, and the allegation was that hanging on the wall was a model 
of a particular filtering mechanism that was prior art, right? It came before it was a prior printed publication and therefore was either 102B or 102A, probably both uh, uh, prior art for purposes of the invention. And the question that we were trying to grapple with in the court was, is that a printed publication? Is that publicly accessible, right? So it was a museum. Uh, so uh, that sort of weighed towards uh, it being publicly accessible. On the other hand, it was a private museum in somebody's residence, right? So maybe it's not publicly accessible. But it turned out that if you knew the right people, this gentleman was extremely interested in showing anybody who wanted to see it. So as long as you could ask somebody, somebody would call him and he would meet you and give you a private tour and that's basically what he wanted to do with his time. So in that sense maybe it was publicly accessible. So it's a, it was a tough question, one that we never got to resolve. Um, my guess is we probably would have decided that it was publicly accessible but I think that, that uh, that's one of the very close cases. So let's on, move on to in public use. right? The key case here is one of my favorite cases in patent law, the Egbert versus Littman case. Right? Um, and the, the technology here is corset springs. Right? Um, and what happens in the Egbert case right, is that uh, the inventor uh, invents a uh, new type of corset spring, apparently this, this split spring with hinges. Um, uh, attaching them was the, the key innovation here. Um, and for several years, uh, the inventors, uh, what the courts describe as the inventor's intimate friend, uh, wears the corset springs around uh, in public very often. Uh, they would uh, look at the, 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 the allegation was that they were, they were experimenting, but there was really no evidence of them experimenting. We'll talk more about experimentation later, but the, um, uh, you know, for, for multiple years, um, the uh, inventor uh, had his intimate friend wearing the corset springs uh, around in public. And the question is, does this fall within the public use bar under 102B, right? All right, so how do you figure this out? Well, first thing you do is you look at the claims, right? What are the claims? Well, the claims are basically cover the picture that you're seeing on the screen right now, which is uh, the split corset springs, right? All right, so now what? Now you check what are the dates uh, before which um, the uh, activities could be a bar, right? And you look here uh, at the at the at the um, um, uh, at the patent itself, and it shows that the specification was fi filed July seventeenth, eighteen sixty six. Now, back then there was a two year grace period. Here uh, nowadays, there's a one year grace period, so you'd move back. You'd say anything before July 17, 1865, would be potentially invalidating prior uses, right? And the court determines that yes, indeed, those uses, most of which did occur prior to 1865, 1864, were invalidating prior uses, right? Uh, this was a fairly controversial holding um, because. Uh, what the inventor said was, this is not public, right? This may be a use of the invention, but because of the, uh, the way that it was used, it was in a corset. It was under the dress of my intimate friend. Nobody actually had any knowledge as she walked around in public that she was wearing um, the new invention corset springs as opposed to any other type of corset springs or, or any corset springs at all, I suppose. Uh, and the question is whether that is nonetheless a public use. And the court, the majority, says that is absolutely a public use. Right? And the reasoning is as follows. That it's not so much the publicness of the use in this case, as much as it is that the inventor was effectively exploiting the invention. Right? That what the inventor was doing was using the invention prior to seeking a patent or prior to the grace period uh, allowed under the patent law for seeking a patent. And that that, the court says, is what in part the statutory bar is all about. Now there was a vigorous dissent, Justice Miller, 
right, says, look, a private use with consent which leads to no copy or reproduction, which taught the nature of the invention to no one but the party to whom such consent was given, which left the public at large as ignorant of this as it was before the author's discovery, was not an abandonment to the public and doesn't defeat his claim for a patent. If the little spring used by one woman, covered by outer clothing, in a position always withheld from public observation is public use of that piece of steel, I am at a loss to know the line between a private and public use. All right, so that's the counter argument, is that this did not make the invention available to the public, so we are not, it is not a public use. Right? But this, is, this goes to the twin, what we talked about, sort of the twin goals of the statutory bar requirement. Right, the statutory bar. And that is it's both to prevent patenting of things that are already available to the public. That is certainly one goal. But that's not the only goal. The other goal, and perhaps the more important goal of 102B, is to try and keep the inventor from being able to get too, to sort of get, have his cake and eat it too. To be able to use and otherwise, or somehow otherwise exploit the invention for some period of time prior to seeking a patent application. And so because that second component, that second interest was implicated in the Egbert case, it was held to be a prior public use, right? So that's the way to understand, I think, these statutory bars. The statutory bars have both of these interests in mind, both trying to, to ensure novelty, right? Meaning we don't give patents to things that are not new, and in particular, 102B is attempting to prevent patentees um, from exploiting their invention uh, for longer than the grace period allows. Right? And just to flag, although we're not going to cover uh, on sale bar, there's a, you know, there is the, that similar to public use or printed publication, um, there's, an, uh, there's an on sale bar. So just like if Egbert um, versus Lippmann, if the inventor there had sold, even if, if he had sold one invention, even if he had sold it in private, that is nonetheless a prior sale and will invalidate the patent um, because it violates the statutory bar. And again, it doesn't matter um, if the public is fully aware of this sale um, because uh, what matters is both uh, is, the, is that it, the inventor is trying to exploit in some sense his or her invention prior to seeking uh, a patent. So there's a big and important exception to the statutory bars um, uh, which emerges in the city of Elizabeth case, right? And that is the idea that if what your use is, and indeed this has been held also to apply to sales, um, is for experimentation, then you can um, uh, avoid the impact of the statutory bar. You can e basically accept the use that you're making it. Right? City of Elizabeth, the technology here was wooden road pavings. You can see the drawing on the left. This is basically sort of a tiled wooden road. Um, and the idea was that this was going to be more durable. Um, now an issue here is how do you test your invention if you are trying to invent a new type of road? Well in order to test it you necessarily have to do something with it and the best way to test it uh, this inventor thought at least was to put it in a public roadway and he laid down this road near uh, apparently a busy toll booth um, and decided uh, that and he would come by every day or two to to inspect the, the um, condition of the road to see whether it was holding up to the traffic to the heavy traffic that was in that area um, and the court says although that this use took place before the critical date and therefore would be invalidating, it is accepted and not invalidating because all what he was doing with it was experimenting. Right? So the purposes because the purposes of his use was purely experimentation, then it does not trigger uh, the prior public use bar uh, and, and does not uh, uh, prevent him from getting a patent. Now, in later cases, in more recent years, the courts have tightened up the requirements to fit into this experimental use exception, right? You generally have to show real experimentation. You have to show, 
you know, notebooks. You have to show that you're keeping track, that you're really experimenting. Um, there have been a few cases where an inventor will, for example, a mechanic will come up with a new propeller for a boat, and and he will install it on a customer's boat and let the customer just have the 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 um, the invention with the assumption. That the that if the customer found some kind of problem with it, um, the in, the mechanic would find out about it, right? Because customer would bring it back and complain, or otherwise mention that this propeller doesn't work very well, and that has been held to not be enough indicia of experimentation. That instead there needs to be a real sort of systematic research project, experimentation project, in order to take advantage of the experimental use exception. But if you can, if you can make that out, then you are free to use and indeed to sell in some cases your invention prior to the critical date. Now as a matter of practice it seems not particularly prudent to do so, but it might be the case that, you know, that City of Elizabeth is correct that there are some types of inventions that just need to be experimented on in a public manner, and if you have one of those inventions, uh, the experimental use exception is something you're going to have to rely on. Finally, let's talk about the changes uh, to the patent law, to the novelty requirement. Um, that occurred uh, with the first to file. This is going to be a, a fairly quick overview, but I wanted to make sure I flagged this for you um, so that you got uh, what the basic idea was. Again, if you take the patent law class, we have much more detail on all of this. So again, two laws on the left is the old law, on the right is the new law. The key change here uh, is this change from the critical date of the invention date to the critical date being the effective filing date. What we mean by effective filing date is uh, the filing date including any priority dates, right? There's a process by which if you file um, a, a, an app, a, a chain of patent applications all covering the same subject matter, um, your filing date is for the for purposes of the patent law is the date you filed the first one in that chain, not the last one, right? So you can take credit, you can get credit essentially for earlier filed applications if they uh, fully disclose your invention. Um, so that's what the court, what the statute means by effective filing date, right? So it's the earliest filing date that you can take advantage of. That's your critical date, right? So looking a little bit more carefully at uh, 102A under the new law, right? A person shall be entitled to a patent unless the claim to mention was patented, described in a printed publication, or in public use on sale or otherwise available to the public before the effective filing date of the claimed invention. All right? So, and paragraph two here, don't worry about, that deals with a particular case uh, of uh, disclosures appearing in pending patent applications. Um, that's something that's better left for uh, the patent class uh, rather than, than doing it here. Um, just know it's there, it's, we're just not going to cover it in any detail. So a couple things to note here. Note that this conflates together all of the 102A and 102B components, right? It has your publication, it has your patented, uh, public use, on sale, and then has this generic otherwise available to the public, how it could be available to the public if it wasn't being used or other on sale or, or, or whatnot is not entirely clear, but it's obvious what Congress was thinking, was if it's available to the public prior to the effective filing date, then it's good prior art. And again, Anticipation remains the same, so the basic inquiry of whether it's actually invalidating or not is still the same under the new law and the old law. The only thing that changes is the date. Right? The important thing about the new American law is that we have a number of exceptions to this basic idea of first to file. Right? The, the idea here is that, that there are disclosures um, that are less than one year uh, that disclosures less than one year prior to the filing date are not eligible as prior art as long as it fits into the either the A or B exception. One is if the disclosure was made by the inventor or joint inventor um, or derived by the inventor or the subject matter had before it was disclosed been disclosed by the inventor. 
right? So what that means is that you, if you sort of look, think about this on a timeline, you have the filing date, and then you have this long, this one year grace period. And within that window, prior art does not count if it is either a, a disclosure made by the inventor, right? So if I publish a paper on my invention within that one year window, that is not prior art against my invention. Now, if I publish it 13 months prior to my filing date, it is prior art against my invention and I will not get a patent. Right? The other exception is that if somebody within that one year um, discloses uh, my invention, right? say somebody else uh, discloses my uh, new invention in their paper uh, within that one year window, right? then I can effectively cancel out their prior art as long as I have disclosed prior. Now note, if I've disclosed prior but outside the one year window, then I don't fit into the exception either, right? Uh, so, uh, because then my disclosure is outside the one year window and doesn't fall into either one of these exceptions, right? Um, so, if I can beat them but still remain, you know, be the first to publish but still remain within the one year window, then I can cancel out their prior disclosure, right? So, that is sort of a trade-off that the that the Congress made uh, to uh, particularly small inventors, right? The idea here is that small inventors might be particularly harmed by a switch to a first-to-file system because it puts such a premium on getting to the patent office quickly. And uh, what we want to do is make sure um, that that we offer some grace period for people to publish their papers. For example, if you're an academic, you want to publish your paper as quickly as possible. Maybe you don't have the money to do the application right away. Or if you're a small inventor, you want to go show your new invention uh, to uh, a trade show or to venture capitalists uh, prior to filing your patent application. So there's a one-year grace period for that, uh, just like at the old law had. Um, and, uh, and we're going to offer that. We're going to also say that you can cancel out somebody else's prior disclosure uh, as long as, as you are the first one uh, to, to disclose, right? So this creates a number of incentives, right? And what it really does, I mean, it not only creates a strong incentive to get to the patent office with your patent application as quickly as you can, but it also really creates a strong incentive to publish quite early. Right? You can cancel out somebody else's disclosure if you disclose first, or you can block somebody else's patent. Even if you don't follow up for a patent at all, you can effectively block somebody else's patenting uh, by disclosing as early as possible. Right? So it's not truly a real first-to-file system. It's not a pure first-to-file system. It's really sort of first-to-disclose. Now, that being said, it still does create very strong incentives to file patent applications absolutely as quickly as possible. You need to file quite diligently, get your stuff done into the patent office as quickly as you can. So this was a controversial change, um, and the, the controversy surrounded how this would affect small and individual inventors. Um, Professor Abrams and I did some empirical research on this using Canada as an example. Um, Canada was the last country prior to the United States to go to switch from a first to invent to first to file system. Uh, what we found in Canada, um, this is our basic results graph, is that that, that vertical black line is the, the law change in Canada. Um, our technique was to use the U.S. data as a control and try and figure out what the uh, difference in difference was uh, in the Canadian uh, patenting uh, behavior. You can see uh, the vertical axis is the individual inventor share. You can see on the the lower the the lower set the lower cluster of data points is the Canadian uh, patent grants. You can see a sharp discontinuity around that vertical black line. Um, which, uh, after a number of empirical tests, shows uh, that indeed uh, first to file does seem uh, to result in less uh, individual inventor 
patenting. And in fact, we find particularly it had a substantial impact, maybe as much as 15% less share for individual or small inventors. And again, the, the theory here is that it's, it is somewhat more expensive um, uh, to uh, compete in the patent system when there's a big rush to get to the patent office as quickly as possible. You know, companies with in-house counsel, with established relationships with patent attorneys are ones that are more likely to be able to get to the patent office quickly with a, with a full and complete patent application. Small inventors, individual inventors are going to be on the other end of that spectrum. Right? Is this going to be replicated in the U.S.? We actually have no idea because it's way too early. Again, it's uh, only since March 2013 that we've had uh, the new law. So there are very few patent applications uh, that have been granted under the new law so far. Um, we do know there was a big surge of applications last March that just before the, the law was put into place in the U.S., um, many people started filed lots and lots of patent applications, much more so than you would have expected given sort of normal seasonal patterns. That suggests people thought something was going to happen. Uh, we found the same thing in Canada, by the way, right before the, the law change in Canada, there was a big surge of patenting. So, so far we see a similar pattern, but again, it's going to be many years before we really know what the impact of the first to file uh, change is uh, in the United States. So that's patent novelty, statutory bars, and a quick overview of the first to file changes. Uh, and uh, I will talk to you next time.